All right, how's it going, y'all? So today, we're gonna to be talking about what is the cheapest way to back up your NAS. And we're mostly gonna be talking about Synology here, just because it's easy to demonstrate here. But these principles all are going to work identically for every other NAS brand out there, because these are really core cost-benefit analysis questions, rather than about a particular NAS brand. And so we're gonna be talking about what is the cheapest way to back up your NAS? And that actually has a lot of different answers to it, depending on exactly who you are and what you're looking to get out of it. So right off, off the bat, you need a backup of your NAS. More specifically, you need a backup of your NAS of any files you deem critical. If there's a bunch of files on there that you really do not care about and you can easily re-download, maybe you don't care about backing that up. But any files on your NAS that they are the primary location where those files live and you cannot live without them, you need a backup. And so the first place to start whenever you're looking at this is sit down and figure out what that data is. And so for most people, I think there are actually two different tiers and often that's how I, I think too. There is the data that you really do not wanna lose, but it is big bulky and if something crazy happened, it would suck but you'd be okay. And then there is another level of data that you cannot live without, period, no question, Mark. It needs to be able to survive anything. And because there's two different tiers of that data, it's really important to figure out what that is for you, how big it is. Because in all honesty, how large that data set is, is the single most important thing that comes down to when you're looking at how large these things are. And so the most important thing you need to do before you start this process is get an exact answer as to exactly which files fit in which of those categories and get a total lump sum of data. And if you can, think about how much that data is gonna grow in the next five years. And we're gonna use that information to really figure out the best way of backing this data on up. And we're gonna kind of work in bins because if we're talking about 100 gigs of critical files, that's easy. If we're talking about 100 terabytes, it's a very different question and a very different answer because of the economics of scale. So in an ideal world, for those critical files, that top tier data that you really cannot live without, you should have what's called a three to one backup solution. And this is a should. I understand that not everybody's gonna be able to do it, but this is what you should strive for. A three to one backup solution is really three total copies of your data and an ideally backed up with two different methods and one of those being offsite. So by far the most critical part of that is that offsite backup. For the data you truly cannot live without, you need an offsite backup. That's because anything can happen to your house or business and you don't want a single location to literally have all of your critical data. That is the number one way you get stuff that's irrecoverable. It doesn't matter if you have 30 backups in your house, if your house floods, they're all going to be destroyed. So for that really critical files, you really should strive to have a offsite backup. And there's two different versions of this. You can either build your own or go to a cloud. And we'll talk about the cost benefit analysis for those in the second part of this video. And for that second backup, that's generally on site. Users who have followed this channel for a while know my favorite thing to start out with is a cheap external hard drive. That's because while I can tell you, yeah, back up your data, have an offsite backup, have a three, two, one backup solution, there is a substantial cost barrier to that. And so it is incredibly important to start with at least a backup, ideally offsite, but understandably it's an okay place to start with just a backup in general. So that is where having a cheap external hard drive is a great place to start because now if anything happens in NAS, you at least have a way to recover. So I'm a huge fan of buying, this case it's a WD Easy Store, Seagate has them as well. I just go on Amazon and literally pick out the largest, cheapest drive I can between those two manufacturers. Honestly, it is a cheap place to start and it's a great way of getting a true backup. If you're also somebody who's cost conscious and you have like a safety deposit box or also a friend's house, Another thing that people will often do is grab two of them. So grab two drives and then get a monthly calendar reminder. Hey, once a month, what you're gonna do is you're going to switch the two drives. So you create two different backup tasks and you flip flop them back and forth. So one drive is always at your house plugged in the NAS 
and OneDrive is always off-site. That way, your NAS is always being backed up locally, so if anything happens where the NAS is destroyed or corrupts itself or any other problems, you have a quick and easy way of getting back up and running, and at most you've lost maybe 12 hours of work. Then, if something does happen to your house or business, well, that's where you've got, maybe it's a month old, but at least you have a backup. And so that tends to be the cheapest way of getting started, in my opinion. If you're talking about more than a few terabytes, that is a very cheap and easy way that has a one-time fixed cost, and then from there, it is just you doing it yourself, and that is an easy way of getting started with these backups. And so that's also a great place to start for that kind of tier one data that is important to keep and you wanna make sure you've got it. But if something insane happened, maybe it's not worth spending X and Y and Z per month to back up. That's another great place to start with that. And that's why if you watch this channel, I do recommend that all the time. And when I'm setting up these NASs for clients and building out purchase orders, it's easy to throw in a $250 hard drive in the total cost of the NAS if it's going to be a backup. It is a very easy thing to do and I try to get people to do it right when they're purchasing the NAS because it's a small fee compared to the overall cost of NAS, and it is very small when you compare about an offsite backup, especially at a cloud. All right, so that is my kind of first place to start with people, people who really want to do it themselves at a budget. And they also make pretty big versions of these drives. Soon on the market, if they're not already when this video goes live, you're gonna be able to buy 24 terabyte external hard drives which is a ton of space and it's very easy for the vast majority of NASAs to be backed up to a drive like that. So that is a great place to start because it is easy, you can see it, you can feel it, and everything's great. So right off the bat in the beginning of this video, if you're somebody whose eyes are about to glaze over when I talk about all the different nuance of all the different backup options out there, try getting started with just this. As I said, they are not too expensive, one-time fee, not a perfect solution, but they are a backup, and that is the number one place to start. Having a backup at all is 90% of the way there. The last 10%, it's okay to wait and try out later on. Ideally, you do it immediately, but that last 10%, that offsite backup, is the hardest thing to add, and something like this can at least get you started. Now let's kind of talk about the different versions you've got if you're looking for more space, or it is important for you for automation. I will often tell people, there are two different types of people in the world. There are people who will put it on their calendar and remember every month like clockwork to switch out the drives. And there are people who will do it two times and then forget and then if anything happens, the backup's two years old. So now for the rest of this video, we're going to be comparing cloud costs to building your own NAS to other solutions out there. And there's a whole bunch of options out there. So the first year I wanna talk about with people is people who are under 100 gigabytes of data. And you'd be surprised how many offices actually fall into this category. Docs, PDFs, don't take up that much space. So if your data is under 100 gigabytes, what I'll often recommend if you're on a Synology is just download Synology Hyper Backup and just go to C2. If you're under 100 gigabytes, it's gonna be 10 bucks a year. And honestly, with how cheap that is, it's probably not worth your time messing around and figuring out other options because that is going to be the easiest thing in the world. Even if you're up to 300 gigs, 25 bucks a year, it's cheap enough where it's worth your time just to set it once, forget about it. And then you also know you can easily get your files back and it's really integrated directly into DSM. So the, the 100, even up to 300 gigs, I tend to recommend that just because it is so cheap and so easy to do. But there's also other options out there. And for other NAS brands out there, look at either maybe paying for some Google Drive storage if your NAS goes to Google Drive, look at Backblaze B2 for cheap. There's a lot of very cheap options out there. If you're really under that 100, 300, even a terabyte level for a lot of people, it becomes very cheap and easy to just go, hey, go to the cloud and it is not worth your hassle of figuring out other options in a lot of cases. So for those small tier users where five to six dollars per terabyte per month is not a big deal, B2, Google Drive, Synology C2 are all easy places to go. And really when you're at those smaller levels, it's also not that big of a deal in general to restore because restoring a terabyte of data doesn't take nearly as long as doing 100 terabytes of data. And so for small tier users who especially just want something that's gonna work and not worry about it, 
going to a cloud option is really easy. And it's something I just recommend people start off with. If you're using Synology, if you're going to something like Backblaze B2 or C2, check out Hyper Backup. It'll have multiple versions and a whole bunch of stuff like that. If you're looking at Google Drive, I would actually instead recommend using CloudSync, unless you want to encrypt your files to make sure that Google cannot read them as well, in which case Hyper Backup is going to be your best option. So at those smaller levels, cloud options are just really easy to recommend. That's because you don't have to worry about making sure your backup's running. You don't have to pay the cost to run everything. You don't have to worry about any of that. And when you're using a very small amount of data, it is not that expensive. All right, so now let's start talking about people who need a lot of data. And obviously this is a bit of a gray area, exactly where the switchover happens. In general, when I'm recommending clients, it's at the five to 10 terabyte level is where it very quickly becomes cheaper to host your own NAS as a backup option as it is to go to another cloud provider. Except for an exception I wanna talk about here. A lot of people, especially a lot of businesses, you're either going to Google Workspace or MS365. Both of those actually give you free amounts of storage for every single user you're at. I have a lot of companies who go, oh, we actually have 45 terabytes in the cloud for free and we're not really using any of it. And it's just super simple. You're already paying for that with your plan, use the space. That is a great place to be. Just, you're already paying for that bill. It is so easy to go to those clouds because it is going to be managed for you, handled for you, and it's basically free because you're already paying for it. So for people who have something like that, it is phenomenal. Dropbox actually used to have an unlimited plan, but unfortunately they've been kicking everybody off of them. And so I've had numerous clients who've reached out to me because they got a phone call from Dropbox that says, hey, we're kicking you off in six months or it's gonna be $5,000 a month because they were using so much space. So the unlimited cloud options are very few and far between, especially ones that have an API that actually allow you to use it. There's a whole lot of cloud providers out there who do offer unlimited space. And I trust that they will actually have unlimited space if they don't have an API where other applications can interface with it. Because all the ones that do truly have unlimited space, that have an API where you can just write a script and back up 100 terabytes of cloud, all of those will eventually be kicking those people off. And we've seen that happening for the past few years with all the unlimited cloud providers like Google Drive Workspace that used to, as well as Dropbox, they inevitably end up kicking people off. All right, so now for those people who are at the five to 10 terabyte level, they need to back up that data and they do not have a easy place to dump 50 terabytes of data because they don't have a Google Drive or whatever this is where it becomes really cheap and really easy to recommend buying a separate NAS. And a lot of people will just use the NAS they upgraded from. So especially if you're growing business and you realize, oh man, that two bay NAS that I bought to start off, it's just not cutting anymore. I'm gonna need more space. Those are the people who I will often say, hey, when you upgrade, stick to 16, even 20, 24 terabyte hard drives in your old NAS, set it up as JBOD, so basically just the two drives combined in space, no redundancy, and it makes a beautiful, simple offsite backup. So generally, if you're over 10 terabytes, within a year, it will pay for itself to buy your own NAS and install your own hard drives because that is a fixed cost and not a variable cost. So you pay for it once, and then you've got all the backup space that you paid for, and that is an easy place to start for those larger people because while clouds are very cheap when you've got a small amount of data, they get very expensive when you get a lot of data. And so right there, that five to 10 terabyte level is where you really should sit down and pick out, hey, I should probably have this on my own NAS because it is going to be cost effective. The other really nice thing about having it on your own NAS is restorability, especially if we're talking about more than 50 terabytes of data the ability to drive offsite, pick up the NAS and drive it back to your office and literally hit a failover button and get back up and running rather than waiting weeks for all that data download is incredibly valuable. So having that instant restore because you can literally go drive, pick it up and get it 
is something that is really, really, really useful to have as well. And something that a lot of people don't think about, especially when you are dealing with a lot of data. By far my favorite NASAs for this on the Synology side are first off a cheap two bay. Go on there. I'll leave a link down in the description below. Get the cheapest two bay NAS with BTRFS and use that. That's because this does not have to be an expensive one. And two bay NASAs, where you may know that I don't love them for starters, if you're using it as an offsite backup, having it as JBOD, you don't really need that redundancy. So these things can easily do 40 terabytes of usable backup space for not that expensive. So really love the two bay NASAs for that. And what I love even more is the NAS you already have. So if you've upgraded, even if it's a few years old, as long as it can run DSM-7 or later, it's actually a pretty good value just use that. And you can always upgrade later on. So love starting with that. And then after that, the next thing I recommend is probably the DS-1522+. If you're outgrowing a two bay NAS, you may as well just go straight to a five bay NAS because you're probably on track to need more and more space later on. And it offers really good flexibility. So then after that, obviously you just keep growing and getting a larger and larger NAS that can cover it. I generally recommend having at least two years, ideally five years of leeway. So you don't have to keep rebuying something. So that's where I said earlier, kind of think about how much space you need. And that is the easiest way to get the offsite backup. So you may have also been looking at other cloud options and seen that there's a thing called AWS Deep Glacier that charges about a dollar per terabyte per month. That is incredibly cheap. I generally do not recommend using it though. That's because Glacier and Deep Glacier are really designed for true archive, not necessarily backup. Those files are stored on tape. And because of that, there are very specific fees and very specific restore policies out there for how you can actually get your files back. And so because these things are really meant for archive, they're not really designed to be able to be checked. So the restore process on them is often just, hey, trust us, or do a full restore. And that can be very expensive. So because of that, I often do not recommend going to Glacier unless you're actually already using S3 and you wanna have a policy to bring that stuff on down. It is a bit of a black box. You don't know that it worked. You don't know what happened. And once you get to the larger and larger data sets that would actually really benefit from this cost savings, it becomes almost unusably slow, especially if you have millions of files. I've not had a lot of great luck with it. It's something that home users use all the time. And yeah, it can work great for smaller data sets, but the people who really save the money from it, those larger and larger enterprises, I just am unable to recommend because of the really difficult time of one, just getting the backup up there and two, actually being able to restore and test those restores. I don't feel like that is a great option. All right. So those are all the different ways you can back up your NAS cost effectively. Really what I like to do is start off with an external drive for people who just have trouble spending a bunch of money up front. I think that having a backup in general is about 90% of the way there of having an offsite backup. Though obviously, if you can, strive to have that offsite backup. Then if you're under a terabyte, it's just so easy to recommend any cloud out there because you're gonna be paying such low money. But then as you start growing, especially once you're at the five to 10 terabyte level, it's gonna be more cost effective in pretty much all cases for you to buy your own NAS and build it and set it at a friend or family member's house or another offsite location. And so once you get to those larger levels, it makes a lot more sense to just buy your own hardware and run your own backup like that. Obviously, think about where you might have free storage space, especially if you're a business owner. It is incredibly common to have 40 terabytes of free Google Drive space because you're already paying for it with your workspace plan. And same thing if you're using MS365. It is often something people overlook and it can save you a ton of money because you're already paying for the space. You may as well use it. All right. Well, that's going to be it for this. Go and leave any other questions you've got for me down in the comments below. If you want to hire me, there's a link for that in the description. All right. Have a good one. Bye.